God gives us so much time. He gives us so much talent. And we use that time and we use that talent. And how we trade that time and talent is how we live. You know, we have to trade so much of our time and talent to our job for money. We trade so much of our time and talent to our children, for our family, to raise our family. We trade it for church. We trade it for, for everything we do. We're trading our time. And we're trading the abilities that God has given us. And we need to look back and see, how are we trading that? Are we making good trades? You know, are we trading it effectively? You know, are we trading, you know, we trade it for, for like I said, we trade it for our jobs. We trade it for our spouse. We trade it for our children. We trade it to build our family. We trade it for our hobbies. You know, I know John's going to trade about four hours today to watch the San Francisco 49ers make it to the Super Bowl. You know, I've traded three hours of my life last week to watch Pittsburgh Steelers get whooped. So... <laughs> So, you know, we trade our time, we trade our energies, and we trade our abilities. So, are we making good trades? You know, are we trading effectively? Are we trading in a way that God would look down and say, that was a good trade? You know, that was a, that was a good trade-off. I want to talk to you for a second about some bad trades. I'm going to talk to you about some of the, the, the worst trades. I don't know what year this was. I thought I had it. But one of the worst trades in sports history was Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees. 
The Boston Red Sox traded future baseball Hall of Famer Babe Ruth for $100,000 and a $300,000 loan to finance a musical called, I can't pronounce it, but just know it was a musical. This was quite simply one of the worst trades in sports history. You say, well, why was this one of the worst trades in sports history? How many of you guys have ever heard of Babe Ruth? Okay, everybody's heard of Babe Ruth. $100,000 uh, back then was a lot of money. But the Boston Red Sox, who were a dominant team at this time, would not win a World Series again until like 2000, I wrote it down, but it's like 2005, I think. And they called it the Curse of the Bambino. And for years, the Boston fans and the Boston ownership and the Boston team would have to watch the Yankees win World Series after World Series with a guy that they traded off for 100 grand. And, and it, it went down as one of the worst trades in sports history. Another one of the, the worst trades in sports history was Bill Russell to the Boston Celtics. Now, the St. Louis Hawks traded Bill Russell to the Boston Celtics for Ed McCauley and Cliff Hagen. Now, a lot of you guys are familiar with Cliff Hagen, you know, but he's no Bill Russell. <laughs> Bill Russell went on to become one of the best NBA centers of all time. He led the Celtics to 11 NBA titles and made Boston one of the most storied franchises in basketball history. So that was another bad trade. Now this next one I want to talk to you about, I was hoping Brent would be here because he would be very familiar with this trade. It was Herschel Walker to the Minnesota Vikings. Now a lot of us guys, you know, we're old enough to remember this. Now Babe Ruth, I wasn't here, you know, Bill Russell was a little bit before my time. But I remember Herschel Walker going to the, to the Minnesota Vikings, and I thought, wow, man, why would you get rid of Herschel Walker? I mean, Herschel Walker was a stud. I mean, he was like, he just, he would plow over people. You know, he was a running back savant. You know, he was just fantastic. But they went on to trade him. He was fresh off two Pro Bowl seasons, but he was aging, and most running backs never age well in the NBA, NFL. Said so Walker never had a 1,000-yard season for the Vikings. While the Cowboys turned those picks into Hall of Famers, Rod Woodson, Emmett Smith, and rode the trades to hall rode, rode, <clears throat> rode the trade halls to three Super Bowl titles in the nineties. Now, if you guys are like me and you know, went to high school in the eighties and then lived through the nineties, you remember, I'm sure John remembers, how dominant that the Cowboys were in the nineties. They beat us in the Super Bowl one year. So you know, that was a bad trade. Now, I was hoping Brent would be here to argue that that was an excellent trade because the Cowboys, you know, they ended up getting a good end of that. But that was a bad trade. That was something that, you know, that they, uh, that the Minnesota Vikings look back on because they traded, you know, what they traded was draft picks. You know, and these draft picks turned into all-star Hall of Fame players who ended up winning three Super Bowls. Now I want to talk to you about some, some business trades, some bad business trades. How many of you guys have ever heard of Ron Wayne? No. How many of you guys have ever heard of Apple Computers? In 1976, Ron Wayne sold his share, which there was three of them. So there was three shares of Apple Computers at that time. He sold his share of Apple Computer for $800. Today, that share would have been worth $120 billion. Now that's a bad trade. <laughs> you know, Babe Bruce was good, but he wasn't $120 billion good. The Manhasset Indians, how many of you guys have ever heard of that? No. On a single period, <clears throat> let's see. Only a single original period document mentions anything about the purchase of Manhattan, the island of Manhattan. This letter states that the island was bought from the Native Americans for 60 Dutch gliders or guilders worth of trade goods, which consisted, consisted of axes, irons, kettles, beads, and wool clothing. So the Indians traded the island of Manhattan for a couple wagonfuls of axes, and blankets, and beads. Now to put that into context, there's millions of apartments in Manhattan, but a two bedroom, apartment on the 34th floor on the 400 East 56th Street is worth $2 million. So, so that was another bad trade. 
Now I got one more. Napoleon, who was fixing to invade Europe, uh, found out that war isn't cheap. So they had a stake of, of the United States right there, in the, right there in the middle called the Louisiana Purchase. Is that right? Yep. Let me go ahead and read this before I mess this up. So, uh, what could be more convenient than unloading France's American colonies to the new, newly founded United States for a tidy $7 million? A British blockade meant that they, it was all but inaccessible anyway. The value of the Louisiana Purchase today is incalculable. But half of the country, but half of a country that creates $17 trillion per year and is still growing would be worth quite a lot. So, you know, throughout history, we see some, some bad trades that's been done. Now, on the other end of that, you know, some people... Who, who benefited, you know, of course, the Cowboys benefited, the Yankees benefited. But we're looking at, at the people who lost out. You know, these guys, they made some, some decisions in their life, you know, and, and some trades and, and things that, that were astronomically bad. You know, whether it was losing Super Bowls, whether it was losing World Series, whether it was losing billions of dollars, they were bad trades. So I want to talk to you. i got three more bad trades I want to talk to you about. There was this uh, family in the Bible you probably heard of. Uh, whenever people would pray in the Old Testament, they would pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, you know, this was, they were very prominent, you know, in, in, in the faith and, and in their relationship with God. Well, today we're going to talk about a couple of Isaac's children. And if you're not familiar, uh, Abraham had prayed for a son. You know, for years and years and years, and he was getting up in age, and he was visited, and they told him, you know, you're going to have a son. You know, his wife kind of laughed. She's like, you know, I'm old. I'm not going to have a son. But they did. They had a son, and, and they called him Isaac. And, you know, as any father does, you know, he loved his son. My son was up here today singing, you know, and I'm just sitting back there, you know, it's crying because I'm so proud of my sons. My other son's at home waiting on the refrigerator. Our refrigerator went dead, so, you know, he's sitting there waiting on somebody to bring it. So I'm proud of my children. I'm proud of my boys. You know, and you, you hold your grandbaby, and you're proud of your grandbaby. So we know how, how proud Abraham was of Isaac. And yet God asked Abraham to, to go up on the mountain and sacrifice Isaac. You know, so Abraham, following God, you know, takes Isaac up on the mountain, you know, and is going to sacrifice him. And God says, no, wait, wait, you know. He says, I've, I've provided you a sacrifice. Don't do it. So we see now that Isaac has children. He has, he has these two boys named Jacob and Esau. So, you know, they're rambunctious just like any uh, other two boys, and they're very different. You know, I was talking with a, a friend of mine at work, and uh, we said it's amazing how different children are. You know, they grow up in the same house. You know, they, they eat out of the same refrigerator, you know, and, and yet they're, they're totally different. And this is, this is the case in this, in this family. We see, you know, Jacob, he was kind of a, kind of a, you know, a, a house boy. You know, he kind of hung with his mommy and kind of like Tater. You know, he kind of liked to stay at home with mommy. And then we see that Esau, he was a hunter, you know, and he would go out and he would, you know, kill wild animals. And, you know, he was tough and he was, you know, gruff. Not so much like David. <laughs> you know, <laughs> more like myself. <laughs> But we see that they were very different, and, and, and they had very different, different goals and had different uh, ideas and things. And we see one day that, that, uh, that Esau is out hunting, and he comes in, and it, it doesn't really say how long he'd been out hunting. I guess he'd been out hunting for a while, and he comes in, and he's hungry. You know, he's starving to death. And he, he sits there, and there's Jacob, you know, cooking his mommy's stew up here, and he's cooking his stew. And Jake, uh, Esau's like, give me some of that stew. You know, I'm starving to death. And he's like, well, he said, you know, if you give me your birthright, I'll give you a bowl of stew. We're fixing to talk about one of the worst trades <laughs> ever. So Esau, and if you're not familiar with the birthright, the birthright was everything. You know, Esau was the oldest child. You know, he was going to pretty much inherit everything, including the blessing, including God's blessing. You know, so Esau's like, yeah, man, I'm starving to death. You know, give me, give me a bowl of that soup. Now, you can have my birthright. What good's it doing me right now anyway? So we see that 
that he trades his birthright to a bowl of soup. We read later that, that God changes Jacob's name to Israel, you know, and his descendants become the 12 tribes of Israel. And we see that Esau's descendants become the Edomites, and they're, they plague Israel, and, you know, they're, they're just a nuisance. And then eventually, you know, they, they kind of get wiped out. And I want you to see what in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, has to say about Esau. He says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up and causes trouble that may defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau. For a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. He didn't just say he was stupid. He said he was godless because he put no value on the birthright and on the blessing of his father. And the blessing was not just, you know, like I said, it was not just material things. And Isaac had a lot of material things. You know, there was a lot of things that, that, that he was going to inherit, but it was the blessing of God. And Esau thought so little of it that he traded it for something that he could have right now, something immediate, something instant. Well, that sounds pretty familiar with people today, that instant gratification. 